Thank you for joining us. We're going to wait a few minutes uh, for uh, to allow other participants to join, and then we'll get started. Well, to keep us on track, I think we'll we'll go ahead and get started, and people can um, kind of uh, join when they're able. Uh, so, welcome to the first of our spring green gardening webinars. It's a series of three uh, virtual green gardening workshops this April. Um, next Wednesday, April twentieth, we'll be covering backyard composting, and April twenty seventh, leak detection and the city's customer water use portal, which is called Aquahawk. This presentation today is on sustainable landscaping. It will be given by myself. My name is Dawn Calciano, a conservation coordinator with the city of Davis, and my coworker, Jennifer Gilbert, who is also a conservation coordinator with the city of Davis. Um, just a reminder too, this uh, class is being recorded and we will be posting the recording and the presentation after the class. And we want to thank you for participating. We're happy to take questions, but we ask you to, um, that we will be taking questions at the end of each section of the class. So to hold your questions for that time, uh, please click raise your hand or you can email questions to myself. It's dcalciano at cityofdavis.org. I'm going to uh, turn things over to Jennifer Gilbert to uh, start us off with our sustainable landscaping workshop. Thank you, Dawn. Um, before we get started into the details of sustainable landscaping, I do want to mention that the county is offering free compost right now for all Yolo County residents. So anyone that lives in Yolo County can go to the landfill and get free compost. And yes, this is the material that uh, we put into our organics carts. Um, and it is picked up by Recology and brought to the Yolo landfill for their, uh, to their composting facility. So it is turned into compost and you guys can go and get some of that compost and see what happens when we truly recycle right here in Yolo County. Um, so that's just during the month of April. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're gonna talk about sustainable landscaping and um, there's a lot of benefits to sustainable landscaping. Um, and the, the major benefits that we're gonna be talking with today, of course, is the environmental benefits of it. Um, and this is the main reason why people want to do sustainable landscaping. There's a lot of other reasons why someone would want to reconsider their landscaping for a more sustainable um, uh, uh, method of, of landscaping. Um, but these are the main reasons why is they wanna do something better for the environment, maybe by um, using less water, using fewer chemicals, helping the, um, the wildlife, uh, native plants and such like that. But um, We'll kind of be touching on these different points as we're going into what the principles of sustainable landscaping includes, but just keep in the back of your minds that this is kind of the, the kind of the big benefits that happens when we think about our landscaping from more of a more than just an aesthetic um, perspective if we look at the full sustainable realm and how we can change our landscaping. Next slide please. So um, the first thing to do whenever you're thinking about modifying your landscaping, updating it, or maybe starting from scratch all over again, is you want to think about what your goals for your landscaping is. And this is an essential step that often gets skipped. Um, but really, your goals to, um, determine everything about what your landscaping is going to be. Um, is your goal just so that when you're looking out your window, that that view is what you want? Do you want your landscaping? Is it more of a curbside appeal where you just want the front of it to look good and the rest of it is not as necessary, but there's a specific aspect that you want to be visually pleasing. Do you want your yard to be some place where you would go out into the yard to enjoy from um, a relaxing point of view? Or do you want it for entertaining people? So you need spaces where you can be entertaining people. Um, do you have a pets that you need to have a pet friendly yard? Um, are you looking to grow food? Are you looking to attract butterflies or birds? 
Um, are you looking for something that's low maintenance or all you care about is low water? There's a lot of different goals that you might have. And depending on what those goals are, you're going to be looking at modifying your landscape in a different light. And so that's the most important thing to figure out first is what your goal for your landscaping is. Um, once you figure that out, then you can go into plant selection and, and maintenance and, and what you're actually going to put there, because that determines the framework for how you'll be doing everything else. Next slide, please. So the first thing we'd like you to think about when you're thinking about updating your landscaping to be more sustainable is stormwater. And this is one of those things that a lot of people don't think about at all. So we're starting off by starting this conversation with stormwater. Um, you need to think about when it rains. And I know with the drought right now, the rain seems like a wish and a dream, but eventually we will get rain again. And as you know, sometimes we get rain coming down as a deluge. And when we have rain falling on our properties, um, depending on how our landscape is designed, that rain is either going to soak into the ground, you know, water your plants, recharge the soil, recharge our aquifers underground, or it might just run off your property altogether. Um, traditionally, some landscapes and uh, buildings are designed to actually move water just off the property. Think about your downspouts coming down from your house, and it, is it plumbed directly to a pipe that goes directly out to the sidewalk? Um, is water just coming on your property and leaving? Is it flowing across your property and washing away soil and mulch so that all that goes down the storm drain? Things that go down the storm drain go directly out to local wetlands and waterways. It's not cleaned. So are we polluting our wet, wet, wetlands and waterways with, with dirt and soil and chemicals and fertilizers? Um, so we want people to start thinking about when you're designing your landscapes, what's going to happen when it rains? Where's that water going to go? How can we design landscapes to hold water and collect water rather than just move it off site? So think about incorporating things like, like, like swales, like you have here, a grassy swale, so that as the rain comes down, the grass will help you know, soak in some of the water. It'll slow the water down so it's not rushing across there as fast and carrying a lot of soil and sediment with it. Um, rain bar barrels are a fantastic way to capture some rainwater to use it later. Um, next slide, please. There's other things that we can consider um, for hardscaping. Instead of doing the traditional concrete or asphalt um, for, for pavements and hard surfaces, permeable pavers that allow water to soak in through the pavers and still soak into the ground are a fantastic option when possible. Here's a parking lot in Davis where the parking lot, um, instead of just being asphalt, it's permeable paper. So when it rains, the water actually can still soak into the ground and help to recharge local aquifers. Um, so there are options. Um, even things like sand or gravel is, is a better option for retaining stormwater on site instead of just having it um, flow away. Next slide, please. Um, as we talked about when, when it rains, how your soil and your mulch can leave your yard. Here's an example of that, where the mulch is right at the edge of the property, right at the edge of the sidewalk on the left picture, so that every time there's a windstorm or it rains, more of that mulch and more of that dirt is gonna leave the property because you can see it's sloping upwards, right? So it's gonna to continue to slope off into the sidewalk and then down into the storm drain in the street. Versus here's another property on the, on the right where they've got um, a little edging that goes around it to hold the mulch and the soil on the property so that when it is windy, when it is rainy, um, that mulch and soil will stay on the property and won't be washed away. Okay, next slide, please. Um, another thing to consider when you're talking about stormwater is when you're building your landscaping, if you're modifying it and you're bringing in soil or you're bringing in mulch, whenever possible, try to have that mulch or soil or rock or whatever it is delivered to, onto your property or at least onto your driveway and be mindful of when you were going to have another wind or rain event to make sure that that material, again, stays right there. You could see in um, some of these pictures, the one on the far right, um, the dirt was left uh, right against the curb, right in the gutter. And you could see by all the mud that's left behind in the gutter that there was some rain that came and it filled the gutter with mud <laughs> um, because the rain couldn't get past that pile of dirt. And then the, the picture in the middle where the um, wood chips uh, were delivered right on top of a storm drain inlet. So, you know, as you can see easily some of those um, those chips and leaves are going to go directly into the storm drain. So just be mindful that that those are active um, active areas. The storm drain uh, does is supposed to be filling the purpose of carrying rainwater away. However, we want to make sure only rainwater goes down those storm drain inlets. Next slide, please. Um, speaking of soil, 
let's talk a little bit about soil. When we're considering um, how to make our landscape more sustainable, it's important to understand your landscaping, both the sun exposures that you have, the wind exposure, and your soil. Your soil is going to make a large determination as to what you can grow, how you're going to grow it, and how often you need to water it. So when we talk about soil, soil structure, we're talking about um, the mineral elements of your soil. So soil is composed of three different mineral elements. It's um, sand, silt, and clay. It's basically the particle size of the, 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 the inorganic particulates that uh, make up your soil. So sand being a larger particle size, silt being very tiny, clay being very flat, and the combination of how much soil, sand, sorry, how much sand, silt, and clay you have determines whether or not you have a loam soil or, hey, it's Davis, clay loam, silty loam, however much uh, you know, loamy clay that we have. Um, it determines on the combinations of how much sand, silt, and clay you have in your soil. So you can, there are some um, soil surveys online that you can find that have been done already of our area. So you can look up in general what kind of clay, um, what kind of clay soil we have. We'll just say that, right? Um, so you can see what kind of soil that we have. You can also do um, at-home test kits or there's professional test kits where you can test your soil to find out exactly the components of your soil. Might as well find out what kind of nutrients you have in there as well, so you can make sure you're applying the right types of fertilizers. If your soil is already extremely high in potassium, you probably don't need to add any more potassium to your soil, so it's good to know what you're working with. Um, next slide, please. The other thing that's important to know about soil is soil is alive, um, especially the top soil, so the first few feet of your soil is very much alive. Um, so this is the, the area of soil where we would be incorporating um, compost, manures, natural fertilizers, soil amendments into. So this um, portion of your soil, it's extremely alive. It's got a lot of bacteria, fungi, both micro and macro organisms. So worms, um, nematodes, all sorts of different things that are both positive and there's a few in there that could be negative um, to help your plants. But it's this, um, this live matter of your soil that is so essential to maintain as part of sustainable landscaping. When we think about fertilizing plants, you should also think about, you're not just fertilizing plants, we need to think about feeding the soil. These um, organisms that are in the soil, they have um, very close relationships with plant roots, either physically or chemically, um, aiding plants in the uptake of water and other nutrients. Um, so it's very essential that our soil is alive, that we keep it alive and that we feed our soil with um, different uh, organic fertilizers is the way to go. Inorganic fertilizers aren't gonna help feed your soil very well. Um, but when you're talking about your soil, remember that the plant roots are not necessarily just at the very tippy top of the soil. Depending on the type of plant you have and how you water that plant, the roots can go down fairly deep. So when you're, before you start watering, check your soil. Um, get a soil, get a soil uh, moisture sensor that can go down a few inches into your soil to check and see. Maybe it looks dry on the top, but you know what? Two inches underneath that, it's actually still nice and moist and those plants are gonna be able to still access that water. You can encourage your plant roots to go deeper by um, less frequent, but deeper irrigation. So modifying your, um, your irrigation to run differently. Um, the other reason why it's important to understand what type of soil structure you have, as far as if you have sand or if you have clay, is because um, different soils are gonna intake um, moisture at a different rate. So with clay soils, <laughs> clay soils can only absorb a small amount of water at a time, after which it just starts running off because it can absorb water very slowly. Now, knowing that, you're not going to want to run any kind of spray irrigation for a long time. You're going to want to run it for short times so that it can soak into your soil and then have like a little bit of a rest and then start another cycle where it can run a little bit and then rest. If you cycle your irrigation like that, if you have a clay soil that does absorb water slowly, you can avoid runoff, even if you have a slope. Um, so it's understanding your soil and understanding how the moisture soaks into your soil is really crucial in order to make sure that you're not wasting water and that your landscape is being um, maintained um, sustainably. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna hand it over to Dawn to talk a little bit more about plant choices. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so now that you have uh, looked at the soil type and um, what kind of 
a soil or multiple types of soil you might have on your property, uh, you can choose the plants that are appropriate to that soil type and the unique microclimate. So you may have some areas of your property that have a lot of shade, others that have a lot of sun, some that are more acidic than others. Those are all things to be considered. Uh, you want to watch the spacing when you're choosing plants. You want to plan for the mature plant size. You may have something that's in a small, you know, um, pot when you're purchasing it, but it's going to be six feet, so, you know, a six foot shrub. And you want to make sure that you're planning for that so that you give plants adequate space. Uh, you also consider, uh, you know, choosing low water use plants or very low water use plants, um, especially native plants. Uh, they provide additional benefits to our region. Um, often they're um, species that um, promote pollinators or wildlife corridors and have additional benefits beyond just being low water use. Um, remember that even low water use plants are going to need water during establishment. Usually that's for the first one to two years. And then usually the water use decreases significantly, but that first one or two years, you do need to be watering those plants regularly to get them established. If you put them in the ground, we get our really hot summers here and they're not being watered, they're probably not going to survive. Uh, uh, Wuckels that you see listed here is called the water use classification of landscape species. That is one tool um, for of the majority of California uh, plant species, you can put that information into Wuckels and say you're looking for this type of plant and you can find out where does it fit on the water use scale. Is it a moderate water use plant? Is it high water use like turf, a turf or a lawn would be? Or is it low or very low water use? And that can help you kind of choose plants that might work best in the area and meet those different benefits that you're looking for. Other things to consider, there's a lot of uh, planting plans and resources out there. We're uh, very lucky that we're really close to the UC Davis Arboretum, which is, has a teaching nursery and um, you know different landscaping areas, it has a pollinator area, low water use plant area that you can kind of go and see some of these plans and get a better idea of what you may want to use on your own property or for your own landscaping. Uh, so some considerations when you're choosing the plants, and this kind of goes back to that first, um, one of those early slides that Jennifer had shown is, are you looking for color? Are you, do you want color year round? Are you okay with color just, you know, certain times of the year? How do you want to lay things out? Um, are you looking for really low maintenance? You want to plant them and not have to do a lot with them. Um, are you looking for wildlife friendly or pollinator friendly species? Are you looking to have a solely native plant garden? Do you want to grow vegetables or herbs in a certain area? And where would you lay those out in terms of your other plants? Um, one big thing to consider is grouping plants by what we call hydrozone. Hydrozone are plants with the same water needs. The reason this is important is that if you have a um, turf in an area that you also have shrubs or low water use plants, you need to water uh, for the water needs of the highest water using species. So you're going to be watering your turf and maybe dramatically over drastically over watering some of those shrubs or some of those other species that you have there. So uh, turf and your low water use plants, you definitely want to have those in separate zones or that usually means a separate valve for your irrigation system. It's also really helpful to have trees on a separate valve or to hand water trees instead of using um, sprinkler spray irrigation for them because you really want those tree roots to grow deep and to have that deep watering less and um, less frequent but longer and deeper watering for those tree roots. Uh, planting plans and resources that we mentioned, the UC Davis Arboretum has quite a few. There's an example of their low maintenance plan here. Uh, there's also the Calscape Garden Planner. There's an image of that. You can um, ask you four questions and it uh, will give you ideas of plants that would be appropriate for your region um, and some of the aesthetics that you're looking for. Uh, there's a homeowner's guide to water smart landscape. Um, all of these resources will be available when we post the presentations. You will be able to access these after the presentation is finished. So irrigation planning. If you're installing a new irrigation system, make sure you keep the as-built plans just like you would keep for your house. It's really helpful for future maintenance. Um, most of us, including myself, do not have the as-built plans for our irrigation systems um, because we may have purchased the house 
Um, we may not have been the original owners of the home, or maybe there weren't as built plans provided when the house was built. I believe in Jennifer's case, she has the as built plans for her, the irrigation for her property. So she is very lucky. <laughs> um, but often you're having to then um, kind of dig around to see where the irrigation lines may be. Sometimes they're visible and you can see if there's an issue at the surface. Often they're not, and there might be a leak underground. And if you don't have those as built plans, you're, you're kind of having to dig around and see where might I have a leak occurring, you know, within my irrigation system. So if you um, are able to, and you're putting in a new system, make sure you hold on to those. If you don't have them, there are other ways to kind of figure it out. So it's not all hope is lost, but um, so determine the type of irrigation that's best for your landscape. Um, that may be, um, you know, subsurface drip. It might be uh, drip irrigation. It might be sprinkler spray irrigation for certain areas of turf. Um, if you've got areas that are close to hardscape, then you're going to not want to put, you know, sprinkler spray irrigation within about two feet or so of that hardscape, because it's really difficult not to have any overspray onto hardscape surfaces. Also consider pressure regulation, um, especially with drip systems. If the pressure is too high, those emitters might just blow off continuously. So every time it runs, you're going to lose, you know, an emitter or have like a sprout of water, uh, you know, water spray coming up. If you're updating your irrigation system and not planning or you know, replacing one, uh, there's a couple of things to consider. But consider MPR nozzles, it's matched precipitation rate. It allows you to have uh, different types of um, nozzles and different irrigation needs all in the same area and to run for the same amount of time. Uh, so, and pressure regulation within the spray bodies can also improve performance. That's, those are all kind of newer things from when a lot of the irrigation systems in our area were installed. So those MPR nozzles with pressure regulation can make a huge difference in um, how efficient your system is. Uh, for drip, uh, there's pressure compensating emitters. This will deliver an even flow. So instead of having really high flow, like at your first couple of emitters and almost no flow toward the end, it'll give an even distribution of the flow across the line and help with the pressure. So converting to drip, there's a lot of advantages. Um, it's more efficient if uh, water usage if it's used properly. It provides water directly to the plant roots where that water, um, you know, where the water is needed. Also minimizes evaporation because you're not spraying into the air and then losing a lot of that to evaporation that's going directly into the soil. Uh, promotes a good soil water environment and avoids, um, as we mentioned, overspray and runoff. Um, some disadvantages that emitters can clog pretty easily, especially with the clay soils that can kind of get in there and, and um, cause some issues. But it's not as easy to see sometimes when they're not working properly, because often we put drip and then we put mulch on top of it, you know, so it's underneath going into the soil and we don't necessarily know where there might be an issue. It can be damaged pretty easily by animals who are seeking out water. They can smell water and find those drip lines and gnaw into them. Um, insects can actually, we've had cases where we've heard of um, insects being actually stuck in the emitters and so that's caused issues um, and humans you know you go to put a new plant in and you actually dig through your drip line um, so there's a lot of things that you need to be cautious of with drip to um, one kind of misconception i've heard um, kind of just fairly frequently at conferences and things that i've been to is that drip doesn't require much maintenance it does require maintenance just like your irrigation system it is less water use if it's all working well but if you've got a hole in a drip line you can have significant water usage um, just like you would if you had a hole in a you know sprinkler irrigation system um, and a tip when you're planting and there's existing drip, you want to try placing the plants uh, close to the drip emitter, because if you've got it farther away and the spacing isn't, you know, the spacing isn't correct, you might have a drip uh, emitter there, but you might not actually be watering the plant that you need. And there are things that you can use. I think it's usually called spaghetti lines where you can attach it to your drip emitter and it can bring it closer. So if you do have a plant that isn't near an emitter, there is a way to get water closer, but you do want to be aware of that, you know, just having the, the drip lines in. And if you don't have the right plant placement, then you might not be getting adequate water. And irrigation timers. Uh, so check your irrigation system, especially with it, um, the, the drought and it being dry out there. We want to make sure that our irrigation systems are working as efficiently as possible. So check your system. Um, it might mean that you do need to turn it on briefly during the day. And that is, that is allowed under our water use restrictions. You know, if you're turning it on to check it to make sure everything's working right, we want you to be doing that. Um, so you check the timer, replace batteries if it has backup batteries if needed. 
uh, run the system briefly to look for broken sprinkler heads and lines. Um, with some of the newer base timers that connect to apps, make sure that your app is updated so you're getting the most up-to-date information um, from, uh, you know, like if you have a weather-based controller. If you don't have a weather-based controller or rain sensor, consider installing one. Uh, the prices of those systems have come down quite a bit in the past couple of years, so they're a lot more economical than they used to be, and there's a lot of different varieties available. Uh, there's some that connect directly through um, a wireless connection and just pull um, information from like weather stations and bring it in, and so they update it based on the weather that's coming in from there. Um, there's others that use an on-site weather station that you've installed, which is usually just something attached to a fence post that is looking at your precipitation and your temperature and wind and things like that. There's also um, soil moisture-based sensors to consider. And what those are is they're actually buried usually in the driest area of your property and you connect it to a valve. And that's actually measuring water at root level. Um, so depending on the size of your property, those can be uh, really helpful too, is that instead of using the weather data that's coming in from the atmosphere, you're actually looking at the how um, dry or how wet the soil is and the soil moisture needs at root level. They've both been shown, the weather-based and the soil moisture-based controllers have been shown to give similar water savings. Uh, be mindful of the watering restrictions. We do have watering restrictions here in Davis. Um, it is currently three days per week maximum watering. You can water less, but three days per week maximum. Um, odd days, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Even days, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. And no watering uh, between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. And this is just for sprinkler and spray irrigation systems. If you have a drip system, you're hand watering. Um, you're watering trees, all of those things um, don't follow, uh, fall under those restrictions. It's really just those restrictions for the sprinkler and spray irrigation. You can also monitor your water use with AquaHawk. It's the city's customer water use portal. It's an online portal. If um, you're not already registered for it, it allows you to see your daily and hourly water use and to set your own usage alerts. You can also usually pretty clearly see in there the irrigation patterns because you'll see use you know, between you know, one and 5 a.m. that's fairly high. And you'll be able to kind of get a better feeling for how much water does your irrigation system really use? And, oh, does it seem high to you? Might there be, you know, an issue somewhere in a certain valve when it's running? So irrigation in the spring and summertime, it's a little bit different from the fall and winter because we live in a very dry, hot area. Uh, landscape water needs increase significantly with the warmer weather, more evapotranspiration, which is the loss of um, water to the atmosphere through the plants evaporation and transpiration. There's little or no precipitation in the spring and summer months. Uh, the average summer water use uh, for, for Davis is around 17 CCF, which is about twice the average winter water use. So about 50 to 60% of the water use in the spring and summer months and often the fall months too for um, the Sacramento Davis area is for irrigation usage. So the majority of our water use is outdoors. Uh, something to definitely be aware of is tree watering. Uh, one of the biggest lessons that came out of the last drought was um, having the, a lot of people took the step, which was a really great step of turning off irrigation or converting to uh, turf to low water use plants and cutting back on irrigation. But then there wasn't really the messaging about make sure you're watering your trees. And so what we found is that a lot of trees either died due to the drought or they were really weakened and then opened more to disease after the drought. Um, so definitely that's one of those uh, kind of statewide lessons that was learned during the last drought. Um, and so tree watering is not limited under the water waste prohibitions or the days per week watering restrictions. Um, it is limited that you can't water by sprinkler spray irrigation more than three times per week, but you really should be watering your trees less often, like we said, less frequently um, and deeper watering. So the um, overhead spray is not a great option for um, tree watering. Part of this is because it's not really getting water down to the roots. And it's, as we were mentioning, you know, it's you're, you're watering more frequently and just and not for as long of a time period, you're not really driving those roots down to be able to pull water up through the soil. Uh, adding mulch um, about three to five inches can really help kind of keep the, the water in the area and also to protect the tree from, um, oh, from, other, from other issues too, uh, disease and things like that. But you don't wanna put the mulch up right against the tree trunk because that can lead to fungal infections around the tree trunk and the roots. 
Uh, young trees need about 10 gallons of water once per week. Mature trees usually just need water about once per month during the really hot and dry weather, and maybe twice per month if there's uh, prolonged heat waves. So sometimes we have those, you know, week or two where it's 105, 110 degrees. You're going to want to be watering your trees a little bit more during that time frame. Uh, there's a lot of additional information on tree watering and care on the city's urban forestry web pages and the Tree Davis website. Talk a little bit about gray water. Gray water is another uh, way that you can supplement or sometimes maybe fully water your landscape depending upon the time of year. So uh, what is gray water? If you haven't heard of gray water, it's untreated wastewater that hasn't been contaminated. And when we're talking about uh, wastewater, we're not talking about what we call black water, like toilets. We're talking about other sources within the home. So wastewater from bathtubs, showers, bathroom sinks, and clothes washers doesn't include kitchen sinks or dishwashers. And the reason for this is actually a, a California health code dealing with pathogens that might be coming off of um, you know, things that get rinsed or cleaned in the sinks or the, um, or the dishwashers. So you're worried about things like you know, salmonella and E. coli, and you don't want to have that going out into the environment. Uh, so laundry and landscape gray water systems are the most common, common type of gray water system. So it is hooking your um, washing machine directly to a um, landscape system that is subsurface where you can take the water from the rinse water if that goes out to your landscape. And typically there is some kind of diverter valve that allows you to, in time periods where we have a lot of rain, which we seem to have no rain or a lot of rain, um, during those times, those time periods, you want to have a diverter valve so that it can go to the sewer instead, so you're not having additional water potentially flooding your property. Um, so there's no permit typically required for a gray water system. Um, there's, you can't use gray water for spray irrigation. Again, you have to keep any of that water on your property because it is coming from um, a gray water usage a reuse of water. So it does need to stay on your property and can't flow to someone else's property. So there's no spray irrigation, no ponding of the water. You can only use it for exterior water use and it does need to be subsurface irrigation. Uh, there is a gray water presentation available at um, savedaviswater.org on our water conservation pages. Also, the, um, there's a lot of information on the city's project partner, Cool Davis, one of our partner sites. And uh, Cool Davis in the city, I believe it's been four years now. Every July, there's an annual gray water showcase. And those presentations are available on both the Cool Davis and the city's websites. I'm going to turn things back over to Jennifer to talk about beneficial species. Thank you, Don. Don is our uh, water use efficiency guru. She knows so much about this stuff. Um, okay, so another thing to consider when you're looking at making your landscape more um, sustainable is to realize that we're not the only ones who are using our landscaping. Um, there's going to be other creatures out there in your yard as well, and some of them are very beneficial, some of them maybe not so. So knowing how to identify with the good guys from the bad guys is sometimes really helpful. <laughs> Um, so there are some, you know, bees are usually fantastic to have in your landscaping because they're going to be doing pollination, especially if you have a vegetable garden, you're trying to grow food, food or fruits, vegetables, um, you're going to want to see bees. Um, there are good beetles, there are beetles that are going to eat your plants. So being aware of that and not just squishing every single bug you see is essential. The other thing to consider is that the bugs that we consider, you know, the good bugs, um, they're often predators. So they're either pollinators or they're predators, right? So if they're pollinators, they're hanging out in your garden because they're pollinating flowers so that flowers can produce fruits and seeds and, and such. Um, if they are not pollinators, the good bugs that we consider to be good bugs, they are predators. And they are there because they're eating the other bugs that might be eating your plants. For example, like aphids, right? Those are the bugs that are eating your plants. And you might have a lot of um, ladybird beetles or ladybugs um, that are there eating the um, aphids. So that is a, you know, ecological relationship that if you want to have the beneficial bugs, you need to have some of the bad bugs. Otherwise, you're not going to have the beneficial bugs. So, you know, what, I, what I'm getting at is, you know, we don't want to see your plants completely covered with aphids, right? Because that's, that's not no good. But if every single time you see a single tiny aphid, you're spraying the plant down with chemicals, you're never allowing that ecosystem to develop all the predators that will control the population. So what you're looking at is trying to achieve a balance in your yard where you've got some of the bugs that are eating your plants, but then you also have a healthy population of the predators. 
and, and being careful when you're intervening um, to remove the bad bugs in such a way that you're not also removing the good bugs from your garden. So it's achieving that balance, right? So no, we don't want these bad bugs to be completely devastating your yard and eating all your lettuce and destroying all your roses, but a few of them so that you can have this beneficial population of the predator bugs is not a bad thing. Um, and I think we might have a slide more later about integrated pest management, but if we don't, this is where the integrated pest management um, concept comes into play because you're looking at how to maintain things and not just jump in every time with a chemical, but you're looking at how to maintain that balance. You're doing an analysis of, okay, how much damage can I handle versus letting nature kind of take its course? Like how can I help nature to take its course to correct these problems that I'm having in my landscape? Maybe I'm having problems because I'm fertilizing too much and it's making the plant growth too lush and it's you know, driving all this aphid population. Maybe I'm watering too much, which is making this ponding area. And so I'm getting a lot of powdery mildew in the garden in this area. It's looking at everything to figure out how to handle landscaping a little bit more sustainable. Um, so in addition to little insects and stuff, we might also think about how do we encourage them to come. So not only just not killing all the bad bugs that we see, how can we encourage more of them? So if you want more pollinators, plant more flowers. Um, you can try things for plant, you know, get setting up, you know, bee boxes to get some of the other beneficial bees. Um, uh, bat boxes, owl boxes to get some predators that might come through. You'd be surprised how much damage uh, a rat can cause in your garden by like Don said, chewing on your drip irrigation or eating all your fruits and vegetables before you have a chance to taste them. Um, so looking at how we can work with nature to help control some of those pest species is also really helpful. Next slide, please. Um, and mulch. Um, if you're looking at making your landscape more sustainable, I cannot speak about mulch enough. I love mulch. I'm sort of a mulch nut. Um, mulch is one of the easiest things that you can do um, to apply mulch to your garden. It's one of the easiest things you can do to make the trees and plants in your garden very, very happy. Um, mulch is going to keep down weeds. It's going to keep your soil cooler so the plant roots can kind of have an easier time when we have these 100 degree streaks of uh, weather patterns. It's gonna prevent um, evaporation from occurring in the soil. So it's gonna help conserve water. It'll help hold the water in there, lock it down tight so the plants can get to it, but it doesn't dry out. Um, it's gonna help decompose eventually if you're using like a wood chip mulch or other organic uh, material mulch. Um, and when I say organic material, I'm not meaning that it's like certified class organic. I'm just saying it's composed of organic materials as opposed to rock or plastic wrap or something. We're talking about wood chips, right? So it'll eventually decompose. And when it decomposes, it's going to decompose into compost, which is then used by the soil. So it's this fantastic way of um, kind of putting a blanket over your garden and tucking your plants in nicely. Um, you can go for a more aesthetic mulch and purchase mulch and have it delivered to your home. Um, you can also just ask tree removal companies to just uh, drop it off in your driveway. Um, you can call tree removal companies or flag them down when you see them nearby your house. I've done both of those things. <laughs> You can use chip drop and have it ordered. Um, just know that you're going to get a variety of different types of trees and sizes of mulch and just different looks of mulch. Um, plants don't really care. They're just really happy to have something around their roots to hold in the moisture. Trees in particular, um, trees love mulch. Trees typically make their own mulch. They drop their leaves and those leaves, you know, in nature, they stay there as mulch and they decompose and they help the tree. Um, you know, in our modern landscapings, we typically tend to rake up those leaves and that's not beneficial to the trees. So leaving a mulch around the base of the tree, keeping it away from the tree trunks, like Dawn said, um, is one of the things that we can do to really help our trees to grow better and it makes them very happy. Um, so again, mulch, I'm a big fan. I recommend mulch uh, very highly. Uh, next slide, please. Um, another thing to consider when you're looking at making how to make your landscaping more sustainable is um, thinking about using green materials. So this is one of my favorite things to do um, is when I am gardening, I'm a big gardener. Um, I like to think of ways that we can incorporate reused material into our landscaping. So for example, um, these are actually pictures of our yard. Um, we've built uh, raised beds out of reused fence boards. When someone removed a fence and they were going to throw out their fence boards, we took the fence boards and we built planter boxes. 
Um, we've gone to the, the Yolo County landfill. They have a thrift store that they have materials there that they sell from folks that were gonna throw stuff away. Um, we got fencing material. So I've got great trellises now for all of our plants to grow on every summer. I built compost bins out of wooden pallets. We use um, milk jugs as tiny little greenhouses over seedlings in the springtime. Um, there's so many different ways that you can get really creative with reusing materials in your landscaping. Um, I've seen beautiful little planters for succulents made out of old shoes and they're very artistic. I've seen some nice ones made out of tires. There's, there's so many different things that you can do with reusing materials, you know, folding newspaper into tiny little seed pots and then growing seeds in there. And you can just put that whole newspaper directly into the ground because then it'll decompose when those little seedling roots come out. Um, there's a lot of ways that instead of going to the store and buying new materials, you can look at what you already have around you and think outside the box. So how can we reuse materials instead of just buying more stuff? How can we reuse what we have? Going to thrift stores and seeing what they have. Again, the Yolo Landfill Thrift Store has amazing stuff that you can reuse into different things as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, and managing yard trimmings. I've got several slides on this. So Dawn was saying early in the presentation, when you're looking at picking plants, is to choose the best plant that fits the site. And that is so critical because what you don't want to have happen is what you're seeing here, where you've got this beautiful bougainvillea bush and it is flowering so lovely, but they planted it so close to the driveway that every year they have to shear it off. And so you've got this ugly side where you can see into the dead wood of the plant because it was planted too close to the driveway or this tree that was planted right underneath power lines. And so you've got this beautiful tree and it is just cut every year because they have to make sure the power lines can go through. So think about what you're planting. Make sure you have space for its final growth. Um, the other reason we want to think about planting things in the right location is because do you really want to be trimming that thing constantly? If you really like pruning, by all means, plant a plant that is way too small for its area. Because then you're going to have tons and tons of yard material that you've got to manage somehow. But if you want to look at, you know what, I don't want to be pruning something every single week. I don't like mowing grass every single week. Maybe we need to think about picking a different plant. Maybe instead of a lawn where we have to mow all the time, think about a different way that you can manage your landscaping so that you're not out there all the time. Um, you know, a lot of our, our landscaping, think about grass. If you think about grass from a, from a crop perspective, you grow grass, you work this, you know, for a lot, you work hard, you, you water it, you fertilize it to make sure it's growing fresh and green and lush. And then you mow it and throw it out and mow it and throw it out. It's like, wow, that's it seems weird. Here we are growing this beautiful thing. And when it grows too much, we, we cut it and throw it away. Um, it, it's interesting. So in, instead of um, instead of harvesting stuff from our landscaping, how can we how can we pick different plants? How can we maintain them so that we're we're leaving the trimmings on site? Maybe it's when we're pruning a bush, we're pruning it, cutting the prunings up into small pieces, and then tucking the prunings back underneath the bush so that they can break down as mulch. Maybe it's leaving the leaves underneath a tree so the tree has its own natural mulch. If you have a lawn and the trees fall on the lawn, try mulch mowing. I swear this works. Mulch mowers will chop up the leaves. If you do it once a week, even in the fall, they'll chop up the leaves into small pieces so that they, they can decompose into the lawn fertilize the lawn, fertilize the tree. Um, think about using your backyard trimmings as they are. Try composting. We're teaching an entire class next week on composting and folks from Davis that attend, we're giving away two fully stocked worm bins that are fully stocked with worms and worm compost. We're giving them away if people attend our composting class. I'm a composting nut. So um, join us, it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yes, if you've got excess landscaping trimmings and you cannot use them all, you, only, you can only do so much mulch and you need to get rid of the rest of them. We do have the brown lidded organics carts. Um, they are serviced once a week by Recology. Um, you can fill those up as much as you want. Pro tip, if you wanna maximize the use of your space in your organics carts, chop things into smaller pieces before you put them in. If you've got branches that are this long, you're only gonna fit a couple of them in there. But if you chop them into little pieces, you'll be surprised how much you can fit in there. Plus, after you fill it up, if you wait a few days and tamp it down, you can put a ton more stuff in there. Um, you can get additional organics carts. Um, there is a charge, a monthly fee to have um, an, more than one organics cart, but it's you pay it once a month and you have it picked up every single week. Um, your carts are emptied every week. 
Um, so definitely use your cart if you can. Um, if you need extra space, you can always ask your neighbor if they don't have extra, you know, if they're not using all of their space in the organics cart, see if you can utilize some of that extra space as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, other things, and I always just mention this just because it seems kind of fun. Um, you know, we do have the Sacramento Zoo nearby and they do um, have a browse donation program where they're looking for certain types of trees and brushes, um, trees and brush trimmings to feed their animals. So they have a list of materials that they actually need on a regular basis. So if you are pruning an eucalyptus, for example, they're, they've got a lot of animals there that would love to eat the eucalyptus. So that's sort of a fun way to make your yard more sustainable. If you know that, okay, this, this thing I prune a couple times a year, you could work it out with a Sacramento Zoo where you can donate it to them. It's just a fun way, especially if you have kids that kind of like, oh, we gotta grow this, you know, for the, for the zebras or whatever, you know, it's kind of neat. Um, the other thing you always can do with extra material from your landscaping is you can always have it hauled away. Um, you do have to pay to have them haul it away. And wow, you can tell how long it's been since I've updated the slide. It says DWR, it's supposed to say Recology. Um, Recology does do um, special pickups of yard material. We do have the last uh, yard material pickup of the, um, will be the spring yard material pickup will happen the first week of um, May. So um, they will be picking up piles in the street in May. It's too early to put piles in the street right now, but eventually you'll be able to put it on the street for a May pickup. Um, but that's always an option as you can have them um, put on the street for pickup at certain times of the year. Uh, next slide, please. So I think that's just, yeah, that's about it. So we've covered a lot of topics really quickly in this class so that if you're looking at, you know, trying to think about how you can make your landscaping a little more sustainable, where do you, would you start to have these, um, you know, to, to think about how you would do that? Things to consider, um, lessons learned, different ways that you can make your landscape sustainable. Um, so there's lots of things to keep in mind. So, um, with that, uh, we will open it up for questions. So if you have a question, you can um, click uh, on Zoom to raise your hand and we can answer your questions. You can also email Don Calciano, that's um, D-C-A-L-C-I-A-N-O, I believe, um, Don Calciano at cityofdavis.org. Um, and we'd be happy to answer questions either now or later. Um, and I can see if anybody has had their hand raised, nobody yet. Um, we will be posting the recording of this class um, immediately on uh, our YouTube page, and we'll be sending out to everybody that registered. You'll get a link to that. We'll also be posting the PDF, so you can click on all these links that you see in our presentation um, so that you can uh, take a look at those. Okay, I see we have a question. So, um, Catherine, you can go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Um, Catherine, we can't hear you. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Sorry, I was outside and I couldn't see my, my uh, screen very much. Yes, so I'm planning to remove my lawn in the front yard and uh, it's basically um, not much sun in there and I would like to put some flowers so part would be gravel and the rest would be mulch and plants and I wonder what kind of plant so uh, plant that would not need much water I could plant to have flowers so kind of all along the year. So there's some great resources, um, particularly for the UC Davis Arboretum. There are others too, like we mentioned, there's the, I think um, CNPS, the California, California Native Plant Society has a lot of native plants for in a searchable database. Um, and then Woogles can also be used, but the Arboretum has a searchable list on their website. Um, they also have their Arboretum All-Stars, kind of their hundred plants that are kind of best suited more for this area and low water use. But in there, you can put in um, particular things you're looking for. So, you know, like you're looking for a, a perennial plant that flowers, or you're looking for a shrub that flowers. Um, you can put in some more of those specifics and then get some suggestions on um, what might 
might, um, you know, work best for kind of a more shaded area or, you know, an area without much sun that you're suggesting or one that's like part sun, part shade, depending on the time of day. So that's probably the, the best place to kind of be able to put in information that's more specific to your um, actual landscaping and get some suggestions that would um, also be low water use. So I would look for ones that are in on the Arboretums page, it will say that they're low water or very low water. I believe they use the Wuckel's guidelines. So that that uh, water use classification we were mentioning. Um, and that way you would know that those are plants that have lower, very low water. Um, and typically their information and information from, from other nurseries and things would provide, you know, how often you ideally would water, you know, water the plants, um, like the frequency, um, you know, how many days per week, but also like how long you should water each time you're watering. So I, so I mean, you, I need to go on arboretum.ucdavis.edu. Yeah, right. that would probably be, that would be one resource to get that information. Um, and that way you could get some kind of more customized suggestions. Um, another really good um, resource is the Yolo County Master Gardeners. The Yolo County Master Gardeners have um, uh, individuals who have trained on different aspects. Some have an expertise in um, drip irrigation. Others have, um, you know, expertise in uh, native or pollinator plants or, you know, uh, low water use plant species. And they have um, uh, a phone number and email where you can contact and ask more specific questions. And they might even be able to provide you a list of different um, plants that might work for your particular property. Uh, so that's the Yolo County Master Gardeners. So I'd say either of those are two kind of local resources for okay. um, planting suggestions. Okay, very good, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, do we have any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today. Um, like I said, it will be posted online. You will be receiving an email with a link to the presentation itself and to the recorded um, uh, recorded webinar posted to YouTube. So thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you.